So a very warm welcome to PPMA's Lunch and Learn session. Um, I'm Lethem Green, I'm the Executive Director of PPMA and I'm delighted today to be joined by the fantastic Michael Byrne. Michael is the Founder and Managing Director of the uh, Lived Experience Trauma Support Organisation and uh, I had the privilege of uh, meeting Michael at the back end of last year in the very beautiful um, St Andrews and Michael was there talking uh, to the Society of Scottish Personnel and Development um, colleagues and uh, I was really blown away by Michael's story and have been looking for an opportunity to introduce him to um, PPMA members and the wider world, you know, anyone who's um, able to join us. So um, it's brilliant that I've got you here today, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here, Nathan. Thank you for the invitation. So what we're going to do today, this is um, our first kind of in-conversation session that we're having. So I'm going to um, kind of take us through the next half hour or so with a series of questions. Some people have sent us questions in advance of today. But if you've got your own questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat facility and I'll pick up the questions as they come in. And um, you know, the power of this uh, experience that uh, Michael will share with us is you know, the fact that Michael will be sharing you know, his own story, his own journey that's brought him, as we call the, the edition from trauma to triumph. Um, so just kind of giving you a little bit of a warning that you know, um, some of the information might be a little bit sensitive to some, but you know, it's a brilliant um, opportunity for you to um, experience what Michael's got to say. So, um, Michael, just uh, share with us, if you could, what uh, led you to creating, what brought about uh, the lived experience trauma support? Uh, uh, first of all, thanks very much, as I said, for the invitation to be here, Nathan, and it's a pleasure uh, to be on the first episode. So. I'm very humbled by that. Um, for me, uh, so my business is called Lived Experience Trauma Support, and the clue is really in the title. It's my own lived experience. And like a lot of people, um, I have experienced a lot of trauma in my life. Um, there's just multiple parts of it. And I'll quickly go through some of them. And um, it's, you know, the brevity of it isn't meant to downplay the severity of it. And I appreciate what Latham just said. Some of it may um, connect with some people here today uh, and triggering in some way. And, and apologies for that, but it's, it's a life experience. Um, I was born in the Gorbals in Glasgow, which is a pretty notorious area uh, in 1969, uh, back in the days when it was okay to be born in the house, if anyone remembers such days. Um, and from a very early age, uh, I was um, systematically abused by both my parents, physical, emotional, and psychological abuse. and. From a very early age, from around about three, my earliest memories um, where they were developed, uh, my earliest emotions are of fear. Fear of the, the abuse perpetrated on me, but also the physical abuse that I was witnessing um, carried out by both my parents to each other. Um, and during those early years, I witnessed my mother stab my father in the head, uh, and she also, she also hospitalized him um, by hitting him with a cooking pot in the kitchen one day. Sounds really funny, it sounds like a kind of cartoon caricature thing, but not when you're um, five, six, and seven. Uh, and that had a really massive impact on my early years, and that gave me a learned experience that I never knew about, and ultimately it stayed with me for the next 44 years until I ultimately had a mental health breakdown. And in those early years, my mother used to tell me that I was only ever happy when I was at school. Now, I'm from Glasgow, nobody's ever happy in school in Glasgow, um, but the reality was that from a very early age, I realised I was safer in school than I was at home. Um, I wasn't a smart kid, I wasn't academic in any way, but I just realised I would rather be at school um, than be at home. Um, so that abuse was perpetrated right through until um, 15, 16 years old, um, and then got I uh, became a YTS. Now, nobody in this audience will be old enough to remember what a YTS used to be, but in Glasgow, it was called a Youth Trainee Scheme. And uh, I started with Glasgow City Council, kind of like an apprenticeship. And my career began in 1986. I came home one evening, I was 16 years old, came home to find my father strangling my mother. And I intervened and threw the one and only punch I've ever thrown in my life, punched my father and was quickly ejected from the household. Um, the irony wasn't lost on me that, um, you know, 13 years of abuse is uh, retaliation and one punch and I'm thrown from the house. 
Um, so, I uh, quickly uh, had to just uh, move in with friends and so on, but eventually I got allowed back into the household. But through all of it, I continued to work. I never missed a day at work. And that was that learned experience from being a child of going somewhere else, work, school, whatever, and not having to deal with the problems that I was having. The next 10 years or so, uh, certainly eight years, my father and I had a terrible relationship. Uh, my mother uh, also wasn't supportive in any way. And uh, in 1994, I got married at a really early age, 24 I was, and I got married. And on my wedding day, my mother and father told me that they were going to get divorced. Um, not a fantastic wedding present, but ironically, for the next two years, it meant the relationship with my father got better. I was working for Glasgow City Council in the housing department, and between one thing and another, he was looking for a house now. So I managed to get him a flat. And then in 1996, I was at a Burns do uh, in Glasgow, came home that night, and uh, my wife told me that the police were looking for me. And uh, the police were looking for me because my father had been murdered. Um, so brutal impact on me, and uh, I went about to the police station following on from that, and they couldn't make any sense out of me, and I really couldn't make any sense out of them. We were speaking different languages. However, the following morning, I got my suit, my shirt, my tie on, and I went to work um, to try and hide and mask the problems. And uh, I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. I didn't look for anyone's support. My belief was that I was a 26-year-old guy from the west of Scotland. I certainly wasn't going to talk to anyone about my mental health or the trauma and so on. And over the course of the next year, there was a murder hunt, there was a trial, there was all of those things. And I never missed a day at work. Ultimately, what was happening, though, in my private life was that my marriage was systematically breaking down because I wasn't communicating. I didn't know how to communicate. I kept everything in for all of those years. And I was really just turning to alcohol uh, and self-sabotaging as a way to deal with the pain. And within a number of years, a, a relatively short period of time, I was divorced. And with that came isolation and so on. A couple of years later, I got into a relationship with a girl. And after about a year or so, um, I was delighted to find out that she was pregnant and we were expecting twins, um, which was beautiful because my father had been a twin. However, after about three months or so, uh, she lost both the twins and I remember finding out about it on a Sunday and it was devastating news and on the Monday put my suit, shirt and tie on and went to work. Going to work was my coping mechanism, it was this learned behaviour from a three-year-old, five-year-old all the way through now and the relationship ended uh, fairly quickly after that and for the next eight or nine years I absolutely self-sabotaged in everything that was going on around me but with the exception of my career. I would rather work and do anything than have to deal with the problems. So ironically, the worse my private life was, the better my career was. At this point, I became a housing manager and managing 50, 70 staff, thousands of houses, because I wasn't dealing with anything in my private life. And then um, in 2010, I, I met someone else. I met my wife-to-be, and uh, we got engaged and we got married in an attempt to turn my life around. However, on the 29th of November 2013, a Friday night in Glasgow, I found myself standing in a pub called the Clutha Bar, where a helicopter landed on top of us, and on that evening, 10 people were killed as a result. Um, and nothing that you experience in your life prior to that, whether it be a murder and so on, prepares you for such a traumatic event. And I won't go into what happened that evening, but it was a Friday night, and on a Monday morning, yeah, the mantra continues, I put my suit, shut and tie on, and went to work. I already knew that I was having a mental health breakdown, but I couldn't talk to anyone, and I was very reluctant to talk to anyone. Um, I didn't ask my employer for support. By this point in time, I was a director for a housing association. I'd left the local authority, um, and I didn't believe that I would be supported, nor did I have it in me to actually ask for help and support. That one year after the Clutha was a very difficult year. I was diagnosed with PTSD, but when I went to the consultation, I never told the counsellor anything about all the trauma I'd previously been in. I was only brave enough to admit I'd been in that helicopter disaster because I felt that was okay. All the other stuff I would be judged negatively for and I didn't want to be judged. I had a fear of judgment. And uh, just pretty much on the anniversary of it, they also discovered that I had a tumour in my throat as well, uh, and they thought it was cancer. So it gets a wee bit like EastEnders from now on, but just bear with me. Um, 
I quickly had to get taken into hospital for an emergency surgery to remove the tumour. They thought it was cancer. Um, ultimately, it found out it wasn't, but I was back at work within 10 days of the surgery because my ethos was, if I get back to work, I can pretend to the world that I'm okay. But I wasn't. Uh, after the trauma of the uh, surgery, and uh, I started to then have blackouts. I would come home from work and I started blacking out and hospitalized, splitting my head open and so on. And through all of that, no one asked me, was I okay? Um, I was going into work with visible signs, but none of, no one in my employment was saying, listen, these things are all happening and you sure you're okay. And ultimately my mental health breakdown came about, and I kind of have a laugh with this, uh, that you know when the world or the universe is messing around with you, when your mental health breakdown begins on the 1st of April, <laughs> April Fool's Day, uh, as a result of a car crash in an Asda car park of all places. And um, I sat in the morning doing my shopping, and this chap hit me side on. I was, stand, I was parked at a pedestrian crossing watching a boy uh, cross the road with his dad, and this car hit me side on. Um, between one thing and another, uh, four days later, I was in hospital with a suspected stroke. Um, I couldn't stand up. I was falling over constantly. And when I got admitted to hospital, I was terrified. Uh, I was terrified that when they'd done an MRI scan, they were going to find out that my brain was full of trauma. Now, I know the difference between mental and physical health, but this was how far gone I was by this point. I believe that when they'd done it, they were going to see how and it's my world, how nuts that I was. I mean, it's not disparaging, I just believe how I was. And I would never be released ever again because they would see all the trauma. Um, so I begged them to let me out. And I always say I was the world's worst patient. Uh, and for anyone who's seen uh, One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest where Jack Nicholson continues to tell everyone, I'm not crazy, it's all you, uh, that was me. So they let me out on the Friday afternoon and I went to work on the Monday morning, obviously. Put my suit, my shirt and tie on. And then my mental health breakdown began in full swing. Uh, my mindset was like a never ending movie. Uh, the bang of the car crash was playing in my mind, was leading me to the, the bang of the helicopter and fostering the bodies that I witnessed that night, was taking me to uh, the day I had to go and identify my father's murdered body. He was murdered when he was 48, I was just about to turn 40. So, a bit of a perfect and perfect storm. And because I had no coping mechanisms and I had no um, security to actually ask someone for help, I reverted back to type and my type was to self-sabotage. And I went about sabotaging my professional career in the hope that someone would say, we think you need help. Stop, we've noticed this. And I made a really good job of it. And ultimately after six months or so of that, uh, in January 2018, my chief executive called me into the office and I firmly believed I was about to get the support that I badly needed and he suspended me for my actions. And that was the last day that I ever worked for that employer. Over the next six months, uh, I became extremely suicidal because now I had no employer as a coping mechanism. And ultimately in May 18, I decided to end my life. Um, however, through one thing or another, and universal intervention or whatever people believe in, um, something happened and, and the course was averted. And in that month of May, my life changed. Uh, for one reason or another, I started to write poetry. And by the end of May, I had a full consultation at the Glasgow Psychological Trauma Centre, which is really a gold star centre in Glasgow that uh, had helped a lot of Pluto survivors. And they diagnosed me with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I was the happiest man alive to be diagnosed with a mental illness. Uh, as you can see from my smile, I'm still really happy about it, ironically. Um, but, it meant that I had a clear, a clear uh, view of what I needed to do. And from that moment onward, I started to actually use the illness to benefit me, not to my detriment as it had always been. So I started to learn now about emotional flashbacks, why I was the way I was, why I always lived in fear, and so on. And then ultimately, I was being invited to, you know, to guest more and more at, at public speaking engagements for Barclays and, and so on, other big companies. And then I released a book of poems um, in November on the anniversary of the Clutter disaster. And as I said, I know I'm self-deprecating here, but there are not many Glaswegians from the Gorbals who will openly say, I write poetry, it's not the done thing, uh, and so on. But they were released, and they're free for anyone who wants them. And it's called Poems from a Mod, My Journey Through Trauma, Recovery, and uh, Survival. And it was just 22, 23 poems about my life during breakdown. 
And on the day it was being launched, there was a psychologist speaking just prior to me. And I know that he didn't say this, but here is what I heard. And what I heard them say was that, you know, people think there's a magic bullet for mental health. There isn't. You just have to wait your four or five months referral and we'll get to you. Now, that's not what he said, but that's what I heard. And what that did in me was a light bulb moment of, no, it's not. I think I can help. I believe that I can help people. And that then, I quickly wrote down a business plan on the back of an A4 sheet of paper. Uh, terrible, but it got me thinking that actually I could use my experiences to help people. And I could use my experiences to help people within the business world because I had 30 odd years of experiences of actually, here's the signs to look out for from an employer's point of view, but from an employee's point of view who's struggling with their mental health, here's some things that you could put in place. And it's just kind of went from strength to strength from there. So apologies that that's a long-winded uh, explanation, um, but it kind of sets the tone and the picture of why I kind of got a lived experience that I set a business up out of. And the last thing I want to be is sanctimonious to say that my experiences are any better or worse than anyone else. All I'm trying to do is probably break down that stigma of it's a man who's willing to talk about mental health and experiences and, and hopefully help some people. Well, I remember when um, I first heard you speak, Michael, and you know, it was very moving. It was a very powerful delivery. You know, it takes a huge amount of um, courage to be able to share something which is so intimate and personal about your life. Uh, you know, it's your, your reality. And you know, I really thank you for doing it again. It's, um, you know, I, I do find it very touching. And there could be, I've got a huge amount of questions that have come through. Um, about that in itself. Sadly, we are pretty limited for time today, but it might be a good enough reason to have you back with us at a future point. However, one question that's just come through, and you make quite a few references during um, the sharing of your story about you know, the sense of putting on your armory, your, you know, your suit and going into work as if you know, that would make life okay. So what is it that you think organizations or people can do to kind of spot the signs with people or is it you know are you saying that it's really not possible to be able to do that and help people who might be suffering the way that you were uh, thanks very much for your kind words and them to to begin with i really appreciate them and likewise when i when i heard uh, you speak it blew me away um so one of the things i speak a lot about is for employers uh, and without any disrespect to the ladies in the audience is see beyond the suit see beyond what actually you're looking at in front of you and, and i know that we're doing this just now virtually but in previous times, you know, if, if if an employer approached an employee, the employee would likely say, I'm fine, I'm okay. Um, but the reality would be something different. And generally, without being disparaging, we generally judge on what we see. So I learned very quickly that if I shaved, had a haircut, smiled, looked the part, people believed that I was okay. And um, what I would always urge employers to do is to look beyond that, is to look beyond the situation, to look beyond what the person is in front of you. So it was very clear for me that I was having some extreme life events going on. My employer would have known about them. And to just simply take from the point of view, well, the person turned up for work, they must be okay. Statistics show that, you know, if you're only concentrating on your uh, performance indicators that are sickness and absence, and if you have a 3% sickness and absence, you then, by virtue of that, have a 97% attendance rate. You have to accept then, if people are turning up for work, in such volumes, they're turning up for work during life events. And if they're turning up for work in life events, they generally need help and support. Don't maybe perhaps want to openly admit to I've got a problem. So for me, it's about looking past what you actually see in front of you and begin to actually look at the situation that a person's in. If you know someone, perhaps a man has just had a family and they're working 14 hours a day, the reality might be that you would think to yourself, wait a minute, you've just had a newborn, why don't you want to go home and spend time with that? Are you having problems? Are you not coping so well? How can we help you? And it's rather than just saying the person's here, we see them as a performer. Actually, let's start looking at people as human beings. Let's start looking at the life events that are relevant to the employer, you know, because senior persons and within the organization have life experiences. And let's look at them in terms of your staff. Uh, and it's absolutely to see beyond what's in front of you. So we've heard um, over recent weeks so certainly since um, lockdown was brought in lots of reference or a lot more reference being made about people being uh, compassionate or kind or even human you know towards one another 
So what is it that um, you think you would be seeing if organizations or leaders or colleagues within that were actually demonstrating qualities of human kindness? How does that, uh, what would that look like on a day-to-day -day basis, do you think? I mean, uh, for me, uh, I think that we all have the absolute ability to be kind and care for each other. Now, I get that the world is changing. And I hope from that that we change as well as, in, as employers or as local authorities or whatever, whatever people may be. But it doesn't cost anything to be kind. It doesn't cost anything to care. Now, we've probably all seen it where your people are having Zoom calls for fun, Zoom bingo, Zoom uh, concerts and so on like that. And it's people being imaginative. The one thing that I think that we've been stuck in in the past is this unimaginative policies and procedures where when an employee perhaps may represent themselves to an employer and say, I've kind of got a problem, we would reach for our policies and our procedures. But they don't apply now. To me, they are not fit for purpose any longer. So we need to start looking at, okay, how can we engage with our staff or our team members and so on in a way that suits them? And I always say, the most fundamental thing we can do is ask the person. I always say, see if you to ask someone, if you were to struggle with your mental health, how would you like me as an employer to find out about it? And how would you like me as an employer to help you? We seem to forget sometimes the, the most simple thing of just to ask. And once we start asking the question, it may be different for Karen as it would be for Lorna, for um, Grace. And then that's when you start thinking of, okay, it's not one size that fits all. And what we start to develop is policies and procedures that are actually suitable for a wide range of people. So for me, it's that caring attitude. And the way I put it to clients is that if your family member came and said to you, I'm struggling with my mental health, can you help me? Your go-to place wouldn't be, I've got a policy for that, or I've got a procedure for that. You would be, sit down, let's have a chat, and let me see how I can help you. And that should always be the starting point for me. Uh, I think that should be what, what it should be. I mean, from my, um... In my own experience, you know, having worked <laughs> in large businesses for you know, over 30 years, one of the key things that I um, realized, certainly dealing in that world of occupational health and well-being within organizations, that when people may well identify themselves struggling with mental health, that the first response, nine times out of ten, is always, well, here is the details of the staff counseling service, as if that kind of ticks the box and delivers kind of their responsibility you know and is there a fear do you think in terms of asking that question in terms of you know the obvious question that would be in front of you you know what would you do if it was a loved one at home yeah i i think that there's certainly certainly the culture within the organizations that i'd worked in i believe that if i opened up and said i was struggling with my mental health it would be career suicide so we have to create an environment that it's not career suicide, it's actually seen as the employer wanting to help their staff members. And we should be, we should be wanting to help our staff members. Statistics show that at any given time, one in four people will struggle or are struggling with their mental health. Now, if we take that as a UK way, if I just do simple arithmetic, that means that at this moment in time, 15 million people are struggling with their mental health. And that's before the pandemic, you know, it's just general stats. So 15 million people in the UK right now are, are struggling with their mental health. So the last thing you are is alone. And if employers recognise that and actually look and say, right, what more can we do? From an employee point of view, the way that we work with organisations is very simplistic in that we take it from the point of view that if you're struggling with anything in life, whether it be your mental health or relationships and so on, you generally want to talk to someone who's been through something similar. There is such a power in that. And that's what we do at Lived Experience because of the, the events that we spoke about. And that's really just a starting point that will help people become more confident and perhaps speaking to their employer and then helping the employer actually creating a wide range of employee assistance, well -be uh, you know, uh, attributes to their wellbeing um, schemes. Um, but it isn't just, oh, we'll give you six weeks of counselling with an unknown organisation that you perhaps have have no um, connection with what we offer and I'm not it's not a sales pitch is that we've actually got some lived experience that people might relate to and that's just an opening of the door that may start the conversation and with us it's not career suicide it's not 
detrimental to your career. And I think if that change in aspect of employers of actually we really care about our staff, we value them and we want them to have a successful career. But we also recognise that mental illness can just be treated the same in some respects as physical illness. If you break your ankle, you're limited for a certain amount of time uh, because you can't run upstairs or, or whatever, but you can still be a valuable asset to the organisation. And then when your ankle's healed, you're, you know, your you're, 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 uh, full capacity. It's the exact same as mental health. If we didn't see employers, uh, employees as, you've got a mental health problem, that's the end of the road for you. Statistics show that in the UK, 300,000 people a year lose their job to mental health related illnesses, either as a result of the employer or the employee feeling that they have to leave. And that's a massive number, but it doesn't have to be that way. So our talk today is all about um, going from trauma to triumph. So yeah. you know, coming to the end of uh, our broadcast and so to end positively, because you, you know, you've got a great um, outlook and personality that projects over uh, to us all here, Michael. What were the steps that you took to practically help you shift from that traumatic experience now to one of triumph that you can share with us? Yeah, and, and how quickly has this went? Um, apologies if I've overspoken and not provided enough time for questions, Just but that's a great that We question. need more time with you, that's all I think, isn't it? Um, for me, one of the most positive things for me was being able to understand my thoughts better. Um, my thoughts for me, uh, I think statistics show that you have on average 60,000 thoughts a day. When I was going through all of the traumas, all I was ever hearing was negative thoughts, and that led me really up to the brink of the precipice of suicide. But when I actually started to do some mindfulness and actually do some exploring of the options that I had in recovery, um, I then started to believe that I didn't have to believe my brain. I know that sounds absurd, but my mind wasn't my friend. My mind was talking to me in a sense that was saying, you're not worthwhile, you're, you're incapable, all the negative things. And then I started to realize that actually if my mind was a being of such and spoke to me in that way, they wouldn't be my friend any longer. We would take a wee rest from them. So what I started to realize was that all the negative thoughts I have, I don't have to believe them. It didn't happen overnight, it's over a period of time. And that really, really empowered me to listen to the positive thoughts and come up with various techniques to dispel the negative thoughts and certainly the self-deprecating thoughts. Um, and there was other things I've done as well, but that's probably the most significant in that all too often we hear the voices in our head saying, that'll never work, you're going to fail, you're going to do this, and they stop people in their tracks. But actually, those thoughts aren't true. They don't know the future, they don't know how capable you are. And sometimes the best thing to do is just to say, no, I don't believe you, I'm not interested. And for me, when I was hearing those suicidal voices, I was saying, no, I'm not doing this today because, and I had a reason to live for the rest of the day. So it's really just about managing and overcoming your thoughts. But I know, Leith, I'm that, you're, you're an expert on that. You're, you know, you're really good at that. The final thing, next week we've got um, Mental Health Awareness Week. So anything that uh, has caught your eye or that you want to share with us is worth checking out, Michael, for next week? Well, your own work, your own things in the morning, your own uh, sessions Thank in the morning. Thank you for sharing, I must say. <laughs> make, make my mornings later. Um, if I can have a shameless plug, I'm also, um, would uh, we are uh, doing two webinars next week, one on Tuesday, it's a certified mental health awareness course, and on the Thursday, it's mental health, certified mental health first aid course, and you receive your certificates and so on. And what we do is we mix the academic part of the course with my life experiences so that it's not just the academic here's the signs to look out for it's actually a real life of Michael hey, why did you go into work with your suit and shirt and tie and what are the other signs what should we really be looking out for so uh, it's slightly different from all the other academic courses that are out there so that's Tuesday and Thursday and, and details are on my website and apologies that that's a shameless plug well, you know, as on most chat shows, you know, the, the guest usually has a, a book or something new that they want to kind of get <laughs> of the, the order. So I'll let you off with that one. And I'm well, sure actually, um, I've got a book coming out as well, but let's leave it at that. <laughs> ah, well, we wait for that. But what I should say, because I've, um, this was one of the, the connections that uh, we had when we, we met last year was your wonderful skill at um, poetry writing. And we'll put a connection on the PPMA website so people can download that and access it, it's, it's really great. Um, and the other amazing thing, which has got nothing to do with um, 
uh, PP Mayor of the World of HR is that, you know, you've got great taste in music because we're both lifelong fans of the jam. Yes. And I hope by the summer, I don't know, I mean, I'm just wondering whether or not lockdown will be lifted sufficiently for you to be coming down to Brighton and we were both going to be enjoying the exhibition of the jam that's going to be running over the summer. So that's something to have fingers crossed for and look out for. Uh, um, I, I, I wait. I, I've always wanted to go to Brighton. Obviously, it's a kind of mod homage. Um, and I was delighted when they announced that it was the, the jam exhibition was going to be in Brighton. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I messaged later right away saying, it's coming to Brighton and so am I. So um, I hope hopefully lockdown will be lifted and uh, we can uh, meet up there and I look forward to it. Well, let's hope we can raise a glass uh, at that point. And in the meantime, a huge thank you to Michael for joining us uh, today. I'm sure that we will uh, be having Michael back at a future um, uh, broadcast. So uh, many thanks to everyone for tuning in. And just before you go, just to let you know that next week, we will be joined by the fabulous Andy Collins from The Mind Gym. He's going to be talking about all things online and learning, some new tips and hints. And um, also we've got our mindful broadcasts, which take place at quarter to eight every morning. And um, I've got lined up next week, or it's going to be the 20th of May, um, John, who's going to be doing some sound immersion. John was one of our guests who we had lined up for conference this year. So he's going to give us a little taster of what that will be like uh, for conference, um, whenever that will be. So. So it remains for me to say a huge thank you to Michael, also to Grace for making this happen. Uh, great for you to, to tune in, PPMA members and those um, visitors, and I wish you well. Take, take care of yourselves and sending you lots of love. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Bye now.